Gosh, what a lot of people. <laughs> I've never talked to as many people before. The first thing to do is to make sure you can all hear me and that this isn't too loud or that there aren't any complaints about the noise. Right. Okay, the second thing to do is to turn this off. Oh, brother, that wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't, oh, uh, yeah. That was a bad start. I just thought. There we are. That's what's meant. Well, they blow past us like straws in the wind. We hear about uh, the energy problem, and we hear about the, the climate problem, and the water problem, and the soil problem and the fish problem, and the acidic oceans problem, and the decline of religions, and the decline of social cohesion, and the decline of social capital. Well, what are we to make of this? Well, there are two things that we could possibly make of it. One is a very dark view, indeed, about how these problems won't be solved in terms which will leave our society in anything like the condition we're used to. And the other view is that if we do a lot of the right things very quickly, then we will be able to save ourselves from the worst consequences. I take the first view, what is normally regarded as the pessimistic view, but I think it's absolutely right, particularly this evening, since we're very privileged to have with us Lord Oxburgh, um, who is teaching at, at, at Dartington, is a former chairman of Shell, to say that there is another view, and broadly speaking, though he is more than capable of speaking for himself, he takes the more optimistic view. Um, so do bear in mind that whatever I say, there is only one view of the matter, and that Lord Oxburgh may want some sort of right of reply, or some corrective at the end. Having said that, I personally have no doubt that, about the situation that we're in, and in many ways it's not a good situation. In fact, in most ways it's not a good situation. The only way in which it is a good situation is that it has been seen before, and that this is the normal way that the life cycle of a large civic society works, works out. They don't have just one problem, they have many all coming at them at the same time. And they realize that problem after problem overwhelms them and the civic society uh, dies. And as it dies, it breaks up. There is a very sharp decline in population. And as in the case, as I may have, some of you may have been there last night when we were talking about this, there is a decline in technology along to a, to, to a, to a situation which is much worse than the situation from which it began. And in the case of the last time it happened in Britain, and you have to, we have to remember this is a cyclical event, a cyclical event which has happened something like 25 times before in the history of the world. The last time it happened in, in, in Britain, uh, it was in the case of the Romans, and they arrived in Britain to find a, a thriving uh, Celtic society in the high Iron Age, quite well developed, with good tools, good farming equipment, ability to make pots and to make roof tiles. And when they left, society crashed, the population was cut down, as the Venerable Bede said, like ripe corn. And many of their technologies declined. And one technology which I will show you a quick picture of, and I haven't got many quick pictures to show you, but I think is particularly telling, is of some cows. And there we see, except I can't see them, there we see the three cows. Number one is a, a Celtic cow. Um, and as you see, this has been measured by archaeologists. You may wonder how it comes about that archaeologists have managed to me measure a, a Celtic cow. But they have, in fact, many, many times. Apparently, Celtic cows and all other cows leave remains for archaeologists to measure in future generations. And true to their kind, the Celtic cow was a hundred, uh, left clear evidence that your average Celtic cow was 115.5 millimeters tall. 
Okay, and then along came the more advanced uh, Roman uh, civilization. And the, the average car there was a, a quite obviously heftier looking beast with a bigger the bottom and higher, fiercer looking car, 120 millim millimeters tall. tall. And then the Romans went from the early medieval, which was a sixth century cow, that's a sixth century cow, which is 112 millimeters tall. And clearly not only substantially less tall, but clearly a smaller, lighter beast for a much a smaller, lighter, leaner, uh, uh, post, uh, early, early medieval society. Right. Well, it seems that the story, what history is telling us, is that in the last sort of 20,000 years or so, 15,000 years of, 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 of history, there has been a very sort of, sort of positive sort of undertow, a sort of Bachian ground base of uh, human, human settlements. That is to say, people living in rural villages, carrying on, inventing religions, um, inventing how, uh, da da dairy systems, uh, inventing, inventing agriculture. And from time to time, something absolutely dramatic happens, and up pops a big civic society and produces cathedrals and pyramids and absolutely astonishing things, and invents emperors and judges and writes books and plays. And then it has this glorious sort of four or five centuries, sometimes substantially longer, of civic, civic life. And then, like a flower, it dies and what they, they, they life goes back to a sort of normal, the, the, the ground base of rural villages. I think that's what's happening at the moment, except I think there is one wrinkle which hasn't happened before, and that is that our civic society is not only a civic society that likes to sort of pop back into a sort of uh, oblivion like the previous ones have, but in, this, in our case, ours is a global one, so that any damage it causes is not going to be sort of left with uh, traces of uh, deserts in various parts of the world which we can explore and send archaeologists to explore. But it actually is something which could actually turn the whole world into a desert. That's one problem. Another problem which is relate, relate, related to it is that it's harder actually to put your finger on any part of our society which in fact isn't part of the civic society. So the idea that one could go back to the decentralized rural villages and they were to pick up the pieces and carry on for the next thousand years until someone develops a new way of doing it is beginning to look a little bit odd. Maybe what we really ought to be thinking about, above all, is protecting and rescuing and preserving and ensuring the survival of that ground base of rural villages. Are there any really rural villages left in England, one does wonder? Or are they just outposts of towns, driving urban cars and using urban energy systems and eating urban food and going on urban holidays and earning urban in incomes? Well, I leave it to you to judge. I'm looking rather as though we are a globally urban society. What I would like to suggest that what we ought to concentrate on above all is localization in the full sense of the word, rediscovering the rural locality. It seems to me that is the urgent thing for us to do. There are many people determined to, mention, to, 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 to protect gene pools of various plants. What we have to do is to protect the gene pool of human society, and that is what is endangered, in my view. Right, I'm now going to turn to a positive and more uplifting sort of a stage of my, my talk by saying that there are many things we, we, we can do, and, and um, even though Lord Oxborough and I may disagree on, on, in a very friendly way on a number of topics, we can probably agree on many of the solutions, which is a, a good thing, but I don't like agreement to be taken too far. Fundamentally, we do disagree. Let me assure you <laughs> that, that. Well, it seems to me that if one puts all these straws in the wind, um, catches some of them, and sort of lays them out on one's sort of desk and examines them, they have a number of uh, qualities in common. And one of the qualities there in common is that they are all in some way related to energy. They're all related in a lot of other ways as well, but you know, I can only do one thing at a time, and let's actually say they are all related to energy. Then one can ask oneself whether it might be possible, possibly, uh, to think of it a little bit like a cat's cradle. I seem to remember in the mists of time when I was about three, 
Some of my sort of elder women acquaintances used to make cat's cradles, which I couldn't. Um, and uh, they showed, I don't know whether this ever happened to any of you, but anyway, it certainly did happen to me, unless I dreamt it. Anyway, they held the, the cat's cradle in one hand and they pulled the string with the other and it sort of closed up, I seem to remember. Does that ring any bells with you? It does, right, yeah, okay, right. So all you have to do is just pull one string and all these uh, bits, other bits sort of close up. So I always thought that I, I have a sort of long-term memory uh, for a lot of things like, like, like that. Um, and uh, they sort of stuck in my mind, and I've never been able to make one. But another theory, theory was, well, I'm making up for it now by saying, well, let's just use it as a metaphor. Since I can't actually make one myself, let's actually use this uh, for what the story might tell. Well, that story is a, a story about e energy. And there are some things one can do about energy. And if one gets energy right, then a lot of other things will come right too. Well, I think the way to get energy right is to put it all energy under sort of a, a very, very clear, a very uh, simple uh, four-part uh, plan. And I think, um, uh, I think it's only fair to call it lean energy, because I think it's a jolly good name, and everything I do is lean. <laughs> so lean energy is what, it, what it's called. And the four-part plan, the, the part, part number one it, it is um, uh, this is a fairly, part one is fairly conventional stuff. You'll have heard this about 25 times before, if not 25,000. First thing, we ought to apply very quickly all the conservation technologies which are available. And they are actually awash with possibilities and, uh, and in prototypes of conservation systems that do wonderful things which make it possible to live in a cold climate and a house without any, any use of fossil fuels. Um, indeed, from time to time, even to export energy. Um, one, one can use, uh, one, people, people are inventing cars that um, can, go, uh, can go long distances on a fraction of the, of the fuel, and much of that fuel is generated by, 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 so, by solar energy. And there are many other systems in engineering. There are lots of ways in which one can run a factory without uh, in, um, uh, using a lot of energy from the national grid by rethinking the way one, one's, one's heating pipes and one's pumps and one's machinery and thinking about the production technology in, in, in fundamentally different ways. And there's lots of rhetoric one can produce about this, and lots of the rhetoric is actually true. And if you want to know any more detail about this, I recommend you should read a book called Natural Capitalism by uh, Paul Hawken and Nicholas uh, and Amory Lovins, and Hunter Lovins. Um, and some of it, actually, that is hyperbole because they seem to assume that the supplies of gas are going to be almost unlimited, and the only task for oil in the future of any significance is going to be to hold the ground up, I quote. Nonetheless, everybody is entitled to a certain amount of insanity and their insanity is fairly harmless and insanity goes. So if, one wants, if you, any of you want to know about the technology, the conservation technologies, um, then do read, do read that book. There are probably other, even better books, but nonetheless, it's good fun reading that book. Now, there's a second, uh, second, second thing one should do. It's not at all like that. You probably won't have heard it 25 times uh, before. You may not have heard it at all, but you may have. You never, ne never know, which is really developing something called structural change, which sounds is, is in fact, almost as incomprehensible as I describe it. But proximate, the proximity principle is a little bit more, more clear. And if there is a disagreement about, uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, solutions between... I won't uh, mention the gentleman more than month, once or twice more, uh, but, but Lord Oxborough and B, uh, it may well be that he is not giving the same emphasis to a structural change as I am, and that is the essential uh, difference that would come in the solutions we are we're, 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 we're talking about. By structural change, by the proximity principle, I'm talking about an absolutely radical rethink of the whole of the way we run our, our political economy. The, our whole use of land, our whole use of transport, the way we grow food, the way we import, the way we spend our time, the way we do absolutely everything. Imagine a society without transport. Well, I think such a society would have various qualities. One day it would be absolutely wonderful. <laughs> uh, the other thing, it's absolutely likely, because it seems to me that the oil peak is going to come very quickly and very abruptly and very untidily and very soon. Because as the oil market changes, it'll change, change from being a buyer's market, nice and easy, easily controlled buyer's market, that is to say, not controlled by a buyer's market, smoothly self-regulating with six billion buyers around the world, to being a seller's market with six tough guys, a seller's market with six tough guys in, in, in control, each one of which will be living a wonderful life with their Cadillacs and so on for the six months that they survive before they're shot by their brother and then... <laughs> exports from that country will close down and we'll be without oil. 
I kid you not, because that's what happens when markets break down. Markets are smoothly running. It's called the law of large numbers. One of the fundamental things of statistics as applied to economics. We have lots and lots of people involved in the system. The system runs smoothly. And that is what isn't going to happen, because round about 20, 2009, 2010, thereabouts, nobody knows when the oil peak is going to happen. But they know it is going to happen. We're going to change, change from a smooth buyer's market to a very unsmooth seller's market. When that happens, uh, transport will begin to cough. If we ever run out of, out of petrol, which I have from time to time in the days when I used to drive a car, it doesn't run out of petrol smoothly. It run, runs out of, it coughs, and you think that something seems got a, a car seems to have got a cold, and then it stops. And that's what's going to happen. There will be periods of two or three weeks during which we don't have enough fuel, and then it'll come back again. And the government will say, that's OK. Our clever international negotiations have restored the energy. Aren't we clever? And you'll be driving around. And then another sort of three months will go by, and then it'll be a four-week outage. It'll be a deeper outage. And those outages will get, get deeper and deeper until eventually it actually does break down. So it's very likely we will be without transport. And we have to think now about what a society without transport would, would, would be. Anyway, the proximity principle, in summary, means reducing things and making things in the same place as they are actually going to be used. Probably all I need to say about that. Uh, you know, you can imagine how fundamental this would be. And I do think, actually, we need to recognize, I think this is a slight diversion, I think you need to recognize how wonderful it would be without transport if we actually think of the values of you know, English poetry and English society and English, in, English life, much of it actually is about you know, the pleasure of actually being in one place. May she be like some green laurel rooted in one dear perpetual place, as W.B. Yeats said uh, in that prayer. Wonderful, wonderful poem, which I'm sure you've got in your anthology, is a prayer for my daughter. Every, all the values of ever need, all put together in one, in one book. And jo ben, Johnson, uh, ben, ben, ben Johnson on Penshurst House, that wonderful poem, and, uh, Marvel on Apple, App, Appleton, and, the, and that, great, that house, a great tube, where all the thinking that produced, uh, en ended up with the turmoil of the civil, civil, civil war came from. All the great things that have happened in English society have happened in very, very much, they've happened at home. We're a very much home-based society. So we will be becoming a home-based society, uh, whether we like it or not. Let's make sure we prepare for it. Anyway, that's the second thing we need to do on energy. That's the proximity principle. That's a difficult thing. That is the fundamental change. When it's going to, it's, uh, the society which would exist after that had, that had happened would be not recognizable in relative to the society we have, we have at the moment. And the third thing one needs to do, but only after those things have been done, either done or thought through in detail, then and only then should we start thinking about renewables. The idea of thinking about renewables before that's happened is absurd. And the reason we do this is because there are various uh, top-down bureaucratic instructions, such as the non-fossil fuel obligation, which require the government to apply certain uh, criteria which involves them building wind turbines in various places and attaching to the national grid, which is going to be in deep trouble. So when the national grid gets into deep trouble in that it can't import the gas it needs to run, then it'll close down and it will no longer be able to e even to accept the energy produced by the turbines. If you've got a system which is in trouble, what you don't do at, at, is at, attach your backup system to the system that's in trouble. You have a parallel system and you think about it in a com completely fresh way. We need to think about renewables in a completely fresh way and only after we've thought about conservation and structural change. That is uh, the first three legs of energy policy. That's really all you need to know about energy policy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Just think about it for a second while I have a drink. Well, there is one more thing we need to know about energy policy, I think I, I would suggest, and that is that it's, it's quite difficult to get there. And what we need to get there is actually to involve the people. We, the people, need to be involved. And uh, we shouldn't be to have told what to do by people who uh, think they know. Uh, we need to have a system which gets us involved and gives us a, an incentive to be involved in an entirely intelligent way. Well, the good news, I have to say, that there is such a system, and it's called tradable energy quotas. And uh, I would like to tell you very briefly about tradable energy quotas, not what I'm here for. But I will tell you about them very, very briefly. Uh, how do I begin? Well, maybe I should just begin by, by saying what was bugging me over this curry, apart from the usual things that bug me over curry, is, uh, is that, that um, a lot of people have been talking for a long, long time about the, the, the case for, for, for taxes, for various forms of, of carbon tax. And I think that's a bad idea for a lot of reasons. I mean, reasons such as you have a tax which is effective enough to affect the rich then it's going to absolutely destroy the poor. I mean, things like that. And in the future, given the sort of things that are going to happen to us, we're not going to be a rich society, and therefore, if we, make, if, if we uh, apply a heavy carbon tax, uh, then uh, there'll be many people who can't afford it at all. We're actually going to be a, a cash-strapped society, so an additional tax that makes us even more cash-strapped is not a good idea. 
Uh, and there are lots of other reasons. Oh, let's go into the other reasons. They're really too obvious. I don't want to insult your intelligence. So what one needs is a, a, a system, a rationing system, like the systems I remember when I was but a lad during the war, um, but better because we have electronics now, and coupons used to fall behind the piano, so it meant that we were out of bread for a week. So it actually makes more sense to have, have it ele ele electronic, and it really, I mean, someone had to think about how to work an electronic rationing system, because we're going to need one anyway, because when the oil and gas outages come, come we'll need a way of rationing. It's probable the government has got supplies of ration books in, stacked up in a, in a warehouse in Virginia Water, and they're probably sending a, next Monday they'll send a civil servant down to the, dust them down. But you know, there are better ways of doing it, and TEX is a better way of doing it. TEX is a short word for uh, tradable energy quotas, as maybe some of you already know. Anyway, I'll just explain how they work very quickly, but I'm, I'm, many of you know. They are a very simple system in that um, the total amount of energy in the economy is divided initially, but not later, as you'll see, into the two sort of groups. One is all the energy that's used by individuals, and the other is all the energy that's used by absolutely everybody else, the government and every other energy, energy user. At the moment, that split is around about 40, 60. And 40% of all energy, about 100% of all the energy is uh, divided up into to coupons, rather, well, actually one should say units, and that 40% of them are distributed free, unconditionally, uh, to all uh, users, uh, uh, and that is called the entitlement. And one year's supply of units is distributed to all, to all, to all users, and that is a rolling year, that is to say, at the end of one week, you know, it's topped up with another week, and so we always have one year's supply of energy units, electronic energy units in our, in our pockets, so to speak, at all times. The rest is distributed in a different way, but that's, it's an entirely uncreative scheme. I haven't invented a single thing here because I don't have any imagination. Um, and it applies something called the, the tender, and uh, as I'm sure you know, the treasury bills and, and government debt are distributed every week by the government, it's something called the tender, uh, and banks and 35 banks and brokers distribute, uh, bid, bid for, the t for, the, for these instruments and then, dis then distribute them to their various clients in a very, very simple electronic way. And that is a very simple thing, so the whole, every energy user in the economy um, has their, um, has their, their allowance of, of, of units, and every time they buy energy. They um, surrender units. Right, well I'm now going to sort of show you one or two of the sort of key things. One of the first, first thing I'm going to show you is the budget. That is the fundamental thing. At the mo in, 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 the, in the first year, there is a certain quantity of text units distributed, which is not very far different from the quantity that actually used in the, at that time anyway. I mean, just at the very moment of announcing that this is going to happen, if should the government actually ever do this, there will be something which economists like to know as the, uh, I don't know why they call this, this, but there you go, it's called the announcement effect. And um, it actually means that by the time when the government announced something, people actually assume it's already happened and they sort of take action. So just the process of announcing this is going to happen will immediately get people to do quite a lot of things by way of energy uh, sa sa saving. So that the budget can be set in a quite a stiff, stiff budget. That's the first thing I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the budget and how it works very briefly. It's two very simple little pictures. And then I'm going to show you the market and how that works. But that's over on the computer. I'm going to have to move this off again. So, sorry. About this. Right. No, sorry, those are the cows again. You've seen that. Right. Yes. Well, there, there as, as promised, that, that is a picture of the text, text budget. Uh, and uh, it's a forecast, um, it, it's uh, set over 20, 20 years, um, except I've only shown 15 years of that, because I can think thought you could imagine the last five. Um, but it's, it, it's, in, it's in groups of uh, periods of three. There's a commitment, which is it's a binding, binding budget. Then it's a more or less binding budget called the intention, and then it's a forecast which goes on for the following 20 years, and which is a pretty simple diagram, isn't it, actually? And this is how it rolls along. In the next year, you see the first year is used up, uh, used up and another year is added, to, added, added towards the end. And what, what's exciting about that is actually more exciting than it looks because, in fact, it gives everybody a chance to plan ahead. I imagine you're in the first year. Uh, there'll be no problem. I mean, all you have to do is just change your light bulbs. So I'm sure everybody in this room has already done that. Or whatever the next thing is to change your light bulbs. So decide to go and see your mother-in-law slightly less often than you do at the moment. <laughs> a, a few, or maybe that would be too uh, contentious. But anyway, so 
a few fairly simple things like that. But then what it, what it tells you is that you know, in 20 years' time, 15 years' time, then 20 years' time, the problem is going to be very fierce indeed. And so you're actually going to think, have to need, need to think very hard indeed about what to do. And actually that budget is going to have to go down so fast, you're going to have to think very hard indeed. And you will start off by not having a slightest clue what to do, because nobody has a slightest clue about how to cope in 20 years with a very substantially reduced budget, apart from bearing in mind the three uh, criteria of lean energy which I've out outlined. But it's, it's okay to outline these things in theory, but actually doing them in practice is another matter. So, what I'm saying is, you will need to do two things. One is, you will need to work with each other as a local community about, in ways, about how to, uh, ways of how to do this because most of these things are only possible if they're done at the level of the locality. You can't do them as individuals. So you really, I'm sure, in Dotness, you do talk to each other already. You'll be talking to each other even more than you do at the moment. And other communities where they don't talk to each other will have to start doing, doing, doing so. You will, there will be a, a real sense of community common, 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 common pur 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 purpose. And the second thing you will need, obviously, I say you will need to do, sounds a bit authoritarian, I don't mean that, that at all, but anyway, yeah, to say that anyway, you will need to do, is to imply your ingenuity and intelligence. Uh, and uh, that is something which, un unfortunately, I think has tended to sort of drop out of the scene for quite a lot, for, for a few years since the, since the end of the Second World War. It's almost regarded as not politically correct to think, particularly to politically correct to think about something which actually has, makes a difference. Broadly, uh, I was forecast by the sociologist Emil Durkheim some, some time ago that we're becoming a more and more managerial society, that is to say, there are various bureaucrats who tell you what to do. And one of the first things you've got to do is to stop thinking. Well, uh, texts are a framework which is only possible to survive if you think. Okay, so that's, well, that's, that's a budget. I think you've probably seen that long enough. I'm now going to make the thing clear by showing you a picture of the market. Well, I suppose I could it from over there, couldn't I? Couldn't I? This is better. Until this works. Um, yes, it does. Right. How's that? Okay. You're now about to see a picture of the market for tradable energy quotas. Um, and it begins at the, uh, in, in, in the middle with something called the Energy Policy Committee. I told this it was a non-creative, uh, non-imaginative scheme in that you know, that's a direct sort of copy of the Monetary Policy Committee, an independent, poli independent policy committee, independent of the government, that actually is paid to use their intelligence and expertise to set a budget and set, uh, not interest rates, but set the, set the carbon budget. And that is the core of the scheme. And one of the crucial points about this, it means that the government is actually not part of this scheme in a direct way. So it's removed from the political process. It does give this, the government such something much more important to do, which I shall come to in a minute. But essentially, it's a hands-off, clean scheme in which the, the Energy Policy Committee is in charge. And then that sets the carbon budget, as you see, which is uh, what I've already explained. And then above, above the carbon, carbon budget, there's something called the Quota Co, which is a sort of a name which is for the registrar. And the registrar, in effect, there no doubt be an office attached, but essentially it's a large computer, it's a large computer database, which is exactly the same kind of database which has been used for many, many years in managing investment trusts, or the investment funds and unit trusts and things like that, and pension funds. Uh, so the technology is already there, just a little bit bigger than the ones that they've used, used so far. Um, and then what the Quota Co does is um, it, 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 it issues um, units, uh, and, it, and it issues units in something that's called the issue. I like to keep things net simple here. And then in two parts, as described before, 40% is in the entitlement and 60% is a tender. And blow me, that all goes down to into one market, except uh, 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 if there, there is a, a trading market there, which in fact would be uh, very similar, in fact, if not almost identical, the markets to markets that all, all, already exist. Everybody's involved, anybody can trade in the market. They feel, they feel, they feel, they feels like it. And someone gets some money out of it, namely the government gets some money out of it, and they can actually, you see that money, that pound sign coming down on the bottom left-hand corner, if you look carefully, that's money going into the government's po pocket. I just want to say that again, the money going into the government's pocket in the, in the, in the, you know, to be used for good purposes, such as helping us actually to uh, reduce our energy uh, demand. Um, and then, uh, then it, sort of, it flows. So this is the other non-creative thing about this. It is based on something very exciting called the value-added tax system, you know, it, which is based on value-added. And this is carbon-added. Um, and uh, so it just flows around in exactly the same, in, in exactly the same way as, uh, uh, as carbon uh, value-added systems. And then it flows up through those various stages. The, um, what I can't read them at the moment, yes. I, I, I can't read my own chart. 
Right, yes, yeah, to, to the fuel and electricity retailers and uh, uh, ho ho wholesalers and fuel extractors. That is to say, I didn't really need to read it actually. I knew it anyway. I mean, the thing is, when you go to a petrol station, um, you buy the petrol and you surrender money, I mean, you give over the money, and then you also give over your units. And then those units go up through to the wholesaler, and then they go up to the, the, um, to, um, the, the refiners, and then finally they go back to the, the company that took the oil out of the ground in the first place, or the company that export, exported it, and they're surrendered, then finally back to the, um, oh gosh, I didn't mean to do that, um, finally back to, oh dear. <laughs> Oh, these technologies things are so difficult. Um, anyway, um, finally, then they, they're surrendered back into to, to, to Quotico, and so it, it, it closes the loop. Well, that's really all there is to say about that, actually. It's, um, it's, a very sim it's a very simple system. I should actually say one or two little sort of things about it, because i tell you one thing about tradable energy quot quotas. It's, it's actually, I think it's very rather bad for your personality. Um, people sort of... Um, there is a phenomenon which I've noticed for quite a long time. If something's got a fairly descriptive title, then people think, well, that's all I need to know about it, really. I don't need to read a book about it or find out any more about it. All I need, the title is enough. And small is beautiful. I uh, was talking to the students about this the other, yesterday. Small is beautiful is a fine example. It's a, I mean, it says on the title, small is beautiful. I mean, who needs to read the book? That's all you really need to know. You know small things being beautiful. I mean, it saves us so much time not to have to read the book. Untradeable energy. <laughs> Tradable energy quotas are very like that, really. You know they're tradable, and they know about energy, and you know their quotas, and that's really all you need to know. And then, of course, when you need to do that, you go to sleep, and you think, oh, that doesn't work very well. He's got that wrong, he's got that wrong, and then you reinvent it. And, um, you know, practically every I, I, I think I probably converted about sort of 30,000 people uh, altogether all, all about the joys of tradable energy quotas. And what that really means is 30,000 different versions of tradable energy quotas, and none of them agree. And so when the government sort of says, what about these tradable energy quotas? Everybody says, oh, I know what they are, and I know what they are. So it's, the government's getting 30,000 different messages, and hasn't, I'm getting a little bit lost about this. For this reason, I'm going to outline very quickly sort of five points, or maybe a few, few more, but rough, roughly five points about, about it. Number one is a guarantee that the energy budget will be achieved, a guarantee. There's no way of not achieving the budget. Number two, it gives one time actually to achieve the, 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 the results, which are the very difficult results that are needed. Number three, it doesn't remove energy, uh, doesn't remove money from the economy. So it leaves money in the hands of the people who are going to need a, a money, sometimes a great deal of money and sometimes involving a loss of income in, 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 in what's happening. So it leaves money in the economy. Number four, which is absolutely essential, is that it's a form of rationing. Rationing is actually a good thing. It guarantees that people will get access to the rations they need. And if they don't get the rations, access to the rations they need, they're in trouble. So all forms of versions of text which are going around about transferring money to people, that makes no difference at all because if the rich actually have more money one way or another, then they can, they can get all the energy that's going away. It has to be a ration, a direct ration, defined in terms of the good itself rather than in terms of money. Number five, how many up to it? Five? Roughly. Uh, well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, sorry. I, I, I was once talking to the Liberal Democrats without a glass of water next to me. And your tongue and mouth goes completely dry. I can't understand. And that was the end of that, really. <laughs> the terrible. So that explains. Yeah, number five is, is the... Tell me, sorry about this autobiography. I'm getting back to the point now. Number, number five is the hands-off scheme, which is that yeah, there's been lots of stuff about how uh, the public will need to be educated, which sounds pretty patronizing to me anyway. That's what they say about how to use it. Actually, the, the public, whoever they are, will hardly need to be educated, whatever that is, in it, because it's, the whole thing is done you know, by card and by direct debit, and they'll be barely aware, aware, of, aware of using it. All they'll be aware of actually is actually the reality of the budget going down, and the reality is that they really are going to have to work together very, very much indeed you know, to get their energy consumption done. So yeah, it's a, hand, a ha hands-off scheme. Number six is that you know, the government at last has a useful job to do, for goodness sake. <laughs> And that job is enabling us to achieve that budget because the government have, will have a moral authority to do this because the government itself is going to be work, having to work within the budget. They're going to have to buy any, every, every little bit of unit, unit, all the units they need. The, the army and navy are going to have to buy, buy units. You know, the hospital, everybody, even, 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 even uh, prime ministerial cars 
uh, driving all the way from Downing Street to the House of Commons. We're going to have to buy units to, to, to do this. So they'll be in deep trouble, as you can see, and they'll be feeling the pain. And because they'll be feeling the pain, they'll know the pain we feel, and therefore they will have to help us, and they will actually have a positive job. They will have the carrots in the Carbon, the carbon uh, Policy Committee, which will have the stick. A clear division between carrot and stick. A clear uh, a criterion for good systems, think for, for system thinking. The government's going to have this effective job to do. And then number seven, I'm sorry, there are, there are more than six. Well, one, n number seven, it, they, they, it, it is something that can be done unilaterally. People say, oh, we can't do this because the stop is being competitive. I don't care very much about being competitive, but a lot of other people should do. So I should go through the motions of caring about being competitive. If one actually were, it would be a, a ludicrous to imagine that we would be. We wouldn't be able to do so because the European Union would obviously have to do it at the same time. If, as a, national, as a series of national schemes, but we'll come back to this, but if the UK were the first in, the only one to do this, just think of the competitive advantage we would have. We would develop tremendously competitive industries. Our export trade in, in, in terms of energy saving would absolutely rocket. Our demand, our demand for energy per, per, per unit of output would, 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 would crash. We'd have the moral authority and leadership, leadership of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we would be off to the races. Unfortunately, it's not going to be as good as that because I have no doubt that when we do it, other people will be doing it at the moment. And actually, the more realistic and the uh, positive thing, which is just about marginally possible, just about marginally possible, I wouldn't put it, put it higher than that, is that it would be a European coordinating scheme. Now, this is absolutely crucial. It is not, absolutely not, an international scheme. It would not work as an international scheme. It's a national scheme. I will say this again, ladies and gentlemen, it's a national scheme, and if it's work on a European-wide basis, then that's a European-wide uh, coordinated basis with every European nation working on a national basis within the European-wide framework. So every Europe would have different budgets working on different criteria in, in different languages with different budgets, a different government work, uh, uh, giving, giving it different approaches. There would be what is absolutely central to good system thinking, there would be diversity and there would be modularity. Um, the principle is, you know, my mantra for the, for, the, for, the, for the moment, if one wants to do a big task, you don't set up a large system to do it. You set up small systems to do it, working within, within a large structure. That is essential. Large-scale tasks need small-scale systems working within a large coordinating structure. Right. My last observation about tradable energy creators before going on to the next topic is something called pull. <laughs> something called pull. I can't. <laughs> Sorry, not, not my fault, Gov. <laughs> it's just technology that doesn't like me. Anyway, this thing, um, I think you know what I mean now. The word, you've got the word, yes. Well, this comes from something which I won't go into in any detail. It's called lean thinking, which is a, a form of management uh, thinking which was develop, uh, developed in, in that um, well-known source of inspiration to us Greens, which is the Toyota motor industry in Japan of 1940s and 1950s. Uh, and uh, they developed a scheme to cut a long story short, which actually is so well organized and so well, 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 well defined that it's, uh, it's more or less obvious that there's anything goes wrong, that anything happens on the production line, it's more or less obvious to the people on the production line what needs to be done about it. So you don't need to have a lot of heavy duty managers pointing at you know, the problem and telling people to get on with it and doing, and giving, and doing the thinking for them. The uh, workers are actually not only required but encouraged and enabled to think and actually apply their own ingenuity. So it's a bottom-up scheme within a, within a, within a top-down framework. Guess what? This is exactly how systems should work. So, in fact, it's a non-authoritarian scheme which requires, I think at the point that I came in on, it requires people to work together and apply their intelligence and ingenuity to achieve it. That's a bit of an abrupt ending to tradable energy quotas, but that's all I'm going to say about that, and I'm going to move on to the next thing, which again was turning this off, I think. Yes, it does. Um. Right. Now, you may think this had nothing to do with what I've just been talking about, about uh, but it actually is central to it, and you will see the connection very soon. One of the uh, uh, things that's going on at the moment, of course, one of the things everybody recognizes going on, it's an entirely uncontroversial thing, maybe the only uncontroversial thing I would say, is that um, we do consume an enormous number of goods, a vast quantity, a most prodigious quantity of goods. You may wonder why 
we do uh, produce this. And then we could also you know, divide the quantity of goods, this huge quantity of good, goods, into two groups. One is the goods you enjoy consuming. The other goods, the, 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 the goods you don't particularly enjoy consuming, you hardly know you do, but you've got to because there no, ain't no choice. And the goods you enjoy are so things like uh, food and uh, shirts and, uh, and toothpaste. Dinners out, things, things, things like that. And the things you don't particularly enjoy are so things such as uh, the police force and um, uh, transport systems and, um, and, 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 me and me mechanics and people to get rid of uh, se sewage and the barges that go down the Thames to dump uh, rubbish in various places. I never know where they go, but presumably somewhere it goes. Those sorts of things. Uh, and there's two different sort of kinds, of, kinds, of, uh, kinds, kinds of goods. And uh, there are no there are particularly good names for those good kinds, kinds of goods. I've been studying economics for a long time, and um, there are three names which kind of more or less circle around the problem. But, uh, but someone may contradict me on this, but uh, ec economics doesn't really recognize that these goods exist. Uh, the three names that are widely used in economics are regrettable necessities, which is quite a good name, invented by, by, uh, by Robert and Nancy Ruggles in, uh, Ruggles in 1960. Um, and, uh, and then there's something called offensive expenditure, which I needn't tell you about, which takes a long, long time. It's a 10-week course on offensive expenditure, but it's very simple, really. Um, and the third one is intermediate goods. And none of these really actually get to get in, but the intermediate goods is the closest thing. And what intermediate goods are, as I, as I, I, I mean them, is uh, this. I've, I've, got a I've got a definition of intermediate goods, which I will now show you. Right. Oh, I'm not doing this, I'm not sure. Okay, intermediate goods are things which are necessary given the size and structure that we happen to have at the moment, but are regrettable in that we don't actually get any pleasure from them. If a way could be found of getting along without them, we would be better off. Well, I don't know about you, but Whenever I'm confronted by a definition, my brain switches off. I really haven't the slightest clue what they mean. So I'm going to explain, explain something, something about, about this. And in order to do that, I'm going to say something about size. Size is a funny thing. Well, the scale is the better word. Scale is a funny thing. Uh, one tends to think that you know, a large scale something is a kind of large scale version of a small thing. Well, actually, it isn't. I hope that makes sense to you. But what I now explain what this does actually mean is that if you scale something up, you don't end up with a, just a bigger version of what, the, of what you started with. You end up with something which is qualitatively different. And the person who pointed this out um, was um, J.B.S. Haldane, you know, the, the, great scient the great scientist, and the guys, were, guys were, the times were, when guys were great and allowed to smoke pipes in their official portraits in 1927. And he wrote this wonderful article called On Being the Right Size, which explains uh, the difficulty of being an elephant. Actually, the difficulty of being anything bigger than a slug, really, or a centipede. I mean, as soon as you start really getting that ambitious, then you start having to sort of invent ways of res respiring and breathing, because slugs can breathe through their skin. And if you can't breathe through your skin, you've got to think of another way of doing it. And lungs is one of the solutions for this. You know? And they're very, very complicated, and they're very extensive, and a huge amount of surface area. And then you also have to get rid of heat, otherwise you sort of get overheated and melt. And one way of doing that is your metabolism has to slow down and you can end up by being slow, so, so slow you get sort of dopey and get attacked by predators and things like that. So, or you need big ears. I mean, there are lots of, sort of ways around these things. <laughs> but elephants have got big ears. I'm, I'm told that's one of the reasons why elephants do have big ears. But on the other hand, um, I don't know. Anyway, um, so that's... So, However, he also pointed out you know, one of the things that, that size doesn't matter. There are a lot of reasons why we are the size we are. I mean, if we were very much smaller, for example, I mean, much, much smaller, you can imagine it would be very difficult for us to handle fire you know, because it would have to be, uh, you know, the fires sort of don't come that small. And, um, or it, you know, <laughs> well, they do, but they, you can't boil any porridge on them. You know. And if you're very, very big, I mean, a, a, a farm is big enough to boil any porridge if you're a very big person. It would have to be a sort of conflagration, you know, you burn the place down. So the very good thing beyond the size we are, because fire is manageable. And also things such as the size of our bones. If you're much bigger, we'd have to have enormous sort of legs like an elephant, which would be difficult. Well, it would not be much different than my athletic performance, really. But that's another story. But nonetheless, and also it actually means we, we fall down less dramatically because they're children, you can see them running ahead and then sometimes before you know where they are, they're on the flat on their face screaming before you've even seen them fall. Whereas because, because we're fairly, fairly tall, we have a sort of slow topple, rate of topple. Uh, so we, sort of, it's easier to stay upright. Whereas if you're much, small, much taller, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't tall very much, but we'd have a small 
fall very much, we'd have even a slower rate of topple. But if we did fall, we'd break every rib in our body, and it'd be bad, bad thing. So for a lot of, a lot of reasons, you know, size you know, is rather crucial. One has to get the size, the size, the size right. Well, this, I'm actually talking about intermediate grids here. And then, <laughs> well, the reason we have, have, in, have in intermediate grids is because we're so big, and if we weren't so big, we would actually just be allowed to let, allowed let our sort of sewage fall into the local river, and it would be all sort of dissolved into pure water a mile downstream, and we wouldn't have to, we'd have, it'd be very easy to run closed systems. And we wouldn't have to have a police force, because people would be, 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 be looking out of the window all the time just to make sure nobody was doing any, any, any harm, and they'd get smashed over, smacked over the, ri over the wrist if they did. And if we were very, very small, we wouldn't we'd be allowed to smack people over the wrist, because there wouldn't be the European Union, because they wouldn't be there, because we'd be small. So, okay, there are lots of... So uh, what I'm really saying is you know, intermediate goods uh, exist because we're very large. And in fact, I think maybe this is a good moment to actually give you an illustration of what intermediate goods are. Otherwise, you think I'm being theor theoretical. And as you know, really, this is meant to be, the title of this is a practical guide to the energy descent. And so I will now give you a practical illustration of intermediate goods. This is probably the most boring list that you've ever seen in your life, which is why I've got to read it. Uh, not only that, but it'll be followed by a list which is even more boring. So, if you are feeling sleepy, now is the moment just to drop off for a little bit. While I... <laughs> I'm now going to read out two lists with percentages. Right. Oh, no, I'm not. Okay, intermediate goods. Um, that's the, these, are, these are goods. I have to say that it's very hard actually to, to break out intermediate goods from uh, non-intermediate -intermedi goods because they don't sort of break off cleanly. I mean, of a loaf of bread, a lot of intermediate good and a loaf of bread, but it's traveled a long way. But actually, the bread bit is okay. You don't really need the packaging. So the thing is, just bear in mind that, you know, not all of these are pure intermediate goods. They're kind of sort of mixed up, but there are lots of intermediate good in all this, particularly in government expenditure. Okay, well... Social security, I told you this is going to be boring, 31% of government expenditure is uh, social security. 17% um, is health. And I'm going to go right, relentlessly right through this list, so you have been warned. 17% right. is health and, so, uh, health and social services. Oh, I can do this with this one, of course. Um, way. Education, 13%. Uh, Defence is 8%. Um, law and order, 5%. Um, transport, 3%. Um, and the rest is 13%, which is housing and urban, other lo uh, lo local services, cent uh, cent uh, local services, c central, gov central government, management, finance, employment and training, industry and science, environmental management, international relations, heritage and leisure, and finally the debt interest uh, reserves and adjustments. Now the point is, the reason I'm telling you this is because here we are talking about localization, we're talking about doing things for ourselves. We actually have to realize all the things we're actually going to be doing without, because when we energy problem hits, when it hits, these systems will fail. And these are the goods that we consume. We're going to have to think of other ways of supplying these. Food, non-alcoholic non drinks, housing, motoring, leisure services, household goods, clothing and foot footwear, leisure, le leisure goods, household services, al alcoholic drinks, personal goods and, and services fuel and power, fares, travel costs, and tobacco. Now, it's sort of getting real, really. These are the things that are supplied at the moment, and if we didn't have them, we would be in trouble. I'm going to give you some examples of intermediate goods in other societies. And one list of intermediate goods is described by an archaeologist called Colin Renfrew, uh, Lord Renfrew, who is a wonderful, wonder, wonderful man who describes um, how uh, a society might be sort of, as a Celtic uh, Stone Age society, might be sort of carrying along, chuntering along, absolutely fine, no problem at all, until they realize there are actually a few more people um, around, and so there actually is a slightly bigger demand for pots, things to drink out of than they thought. They thought. Um, but the thing is, uh, just at that time, all the pots are being made, made by the local... It's the peas, isn't it? Yeah. I'd be saying an awful lot about pots. So we're going to have... I can't think of a solution to this. 
Anyway, uh, this is the situation. So, um, anyway, the farmers are making, uh, are making these pots, and uh, every time they make the pots, they have to start up their stoves, and they have to get the clay, and they have to remind themselves how to do it, and it's all rather slow and inefficient. Uh, and it's not really working very well. And the quality of pots they're producing is not very good. And so, well, they say very, very reasonable. Well, why, actually, why don't we actually have some, uh, some of us actually specialising on, on make, in, in making pots and, uh, and forgetting about the farming? So they think that's a really, very good idea. So they do. So they set up them, some, uh, some uh, specialist pot, pot makers. And as we know from having read our Adam Smith, that if you set, set up specialists to do something, uh, rather than doing, uh, having sort of a generalist doing the whole thing, you end up with an increase of productivity, I think he said 4,166 times as product, productive as you were before, something like that. Anyway, so that's what, you, that's what you, uh, they, they do. And, uh, but, there, but then, of course, there is a trouble. But if, you find all, if all the pots are being made by specialists, then that means they're not being made locally, in which case you have to have roads uh, to carry them around, and you have to have, got to have wagons and things like that. And then you have, um, then you have a tax uh, to pay for the roads, um, which is quite reasonable, of course. I mean, you can't have roads without tax, really. Um, then you have to have uh, administrators to, to, to administer the tax. Um, and then, of course, the minister has got to live somewhere, so they have to live in towns. Um, and, um, and then there are more, end up with more jobs in towns, and, uh, and, and because administrators need people to work with, because they're just administrating tax, they can't do anything else, they can't cook or grow food or anything, so they need other people to work in towns. So the population of towns arises, and then this begins to uh, upset uh, the uh, social structure of the, of the, of the, of the countryside, and so it's a sexual... Uh, um, routine, routine, uh, not that routine isn't the right word, but sex, sexual arrangements have changed, and so birth control s systems uh, begin to decline, so the population begins to rise. Uh, it's all because you want, you want these pots. And then, but anyway, and then they've got no. So the population rises, and then once the population has risen, then, then you actually need more food. Um, so, well, you say, well, that's okay, there are lots and lots of people around now. So, you actually make an army, uh, and you invade the neighbor, neighbor, and you get the food, and actually you also get a lot of other things. And you become very rich, and, and, um, and things are going very well. And the result of it is that you need more pots. So it starts again. And all that thing, all those things in that list, uh, of, uh, except the pots at the beginning and end, they all consist entirely of intermediate goods. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is one illustration of how intermediate goods occur. And the result of that, you get something which um, uh, Colin Renfrew describes, which is nucleation. I'm going to show you what nucleation means. You actually already had. A preview of it, which I didn't mean to show you, but I'll show you the real thing now, I think. Um. Oh, no, 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 no. How, how do you turn back? Oh, I know, you, you, you're resisting, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh. There we are. Right, that, that, sorry about how difficult that seemed to be. But anyway, that is uh, not my diagram, it's uh, Colin Renfrew's diagram of nucleation. Uh, and you begin with uh, it's a pre-pot society, and you begin with lots and lots of villages, kind of the little totnesses, little Robin Hopkins round, round, round the place. Those little dots on the left are places with Rob Hopkins in control, and people, <laughs> and people like him. But I'm going to see the place on the right is quite different. It's called, it's, it's called nucleation. And you end up with actually to fewer uh, rural um, settlements, uh, and some very large, um, some very large towns, and some absolutely enormous towns. And you clearly, in enormous towns like that, you need authoritarian emperors and people like that to run, to, to run it. So it becomes the whole thing becomes quite expensive to, to run, and you need lots of intermediate goods. And I think that story is quite satisfactory. But you know, if something's satisfactory, the best thing to do is to add to it. And I'll tell you two more stories, but tell you come come to more or less the same conclusion if that's all right. One is uh, by a lady called Esther Bozerup, who describes the, uh, the development of agriculture. And you begin with um, hunting and gathering, which is a very, very ener energy efficient way of carrying on. You, end up with a lot of, you have a lot of free time. Um, but then for, if you end up, one, one, am I running short of time? If we, you need more, I've got lots more to say. <laughs> if you need more food, I will, I will speed up. If you need more food. Uh, then, okay, right, where well, you start you, um, you felling some trees. It's called Swidden agriculture, and it's very efficient because the trees leave behind unless they're conifers, wherever Stefan is. I can't see him. There he is. Uh, not conifers. I'm not talking about conifers. Anyway, if you, leave, you fell trees, non-conifers, you end up with a very fertile soil, and you can grow uh, food in, uh, with really out, without very much trouble because one thing is that it's in the middle of the forest. The weeds can't get there, so there's no weeding to do. 
lots and lots of uh, food uh, product and uh, output. And when you know, the soil starts getting exhausted, then you just move on somewhere else. And that's absolutely fine. Then you don't do that a little bit too often. Then you actually have to come back more quickly. And that's called bush um, fallow. And that's more difficult because you start having to do some weeding then. And, uh, it, uh, and there's quite a lot more energy and work has to go into it. So at every stage, you end up with more work going into it. More food, but much, much more work. And it becomes much more efficient. You have to get up early. And uh, instead of working for just uh, two hours a day as a hunter and gatherer, you start having to work for six hours a day. Then it goes up further you know, to short fallow, in which you have to come back to it so quickly that you know, there's grass there. And if there's grass there, then it's very difficult to dig up. You need to, to have that. You need to plow it. And if you need, need plow it, to plow it, you need oxen, and you need to breed the oxen, and you need to keep, keep the oxen in and, and, and uh, build fences all over the place. And then if they're your oxen, you need to have people looking after it. And then you have to have laws to ensure you know, that you know, everybody knows whose oxen they are. And, and then you go on to annual cropping, which is incredibly hard work, and then to multiple cropping, cropping which is even harder work. All, of the, all these stages, they do produce more food, but actually they take a hell of a lot more intermediate goods. And we must quickly move on from intermediate goods, otherwise I shall run out of time. I, give you, I want to give you the last, the last um, illustration of this point, which I would rather like, by, by a guy called Richard Wilkinson, who is much disliked by economists, which is a very good thing in his favor. And he, uh, he describes the inter process of intermediate goods in the case of uh, coal mining. I mean, it began you know, in the wonderful days when we didn't need to use coal, though it, coal, coal had been used for a long time. Essentially, we lived on wood, which is very easy to carry around. It's very clean, and it burns cleanly, and the, uh, smoke, the smoke is delicious. And uh, you, can, you, know, grow, you can grow it in your garden and uh, sit around it. Uh, then, uh, but coal from shallow mines is more or less OK. You have to try and transport it a long way. And it begins starts getting a little bit dangerous, and it's very dirty, and the smoke is toxic. Um, but that's nothing like as much trouble as it is when you start having, uh, getting coal from deep mines, and you start going to the intermediate good business in a very, very serious way. Indeed, you've got to get pumps, and you've got to invent steam engines and things. And then you've got to, once you've cracked that, you've got to build transport systems up to, uh, three times over, roads which work, and they, then they don't work because they get rutted. Then you have to build canals, and they don't work because they're not fast enough. And then you have to build, build, build railways, and then you have to build towns. Result of which you build, end up by building an enormous civilization, all because you're getting short of wood. Now, I'm now going to say, let us suppose that our, owing to the oil peak and owing to action on climate change, owing to all the straws in the wind I began by talking about, that our entire intermediate economy crashes and we don't have any intermediate goods any longer, and that we're looking towards that diagram picture on the right with these Hopkins-led rural economies, relocalized economies, the process of relocalization. And we are trying to live in an economy in which the intermediate economy doesn't work any longer. What would we do? Well, I'm not going to take you through that entire list, but there actually are one or two elements on the list which might be worth taking, taking you through, if that's all right. Supposing the first thing is social security systems. As you may, I'm sure you'll remember, 31% of government expenditure on 30, social security systems. So in one, one's localized economy, uh, one has a lot of unemployed people, and one has a lot of old people, and ill people, and they, depend, they need social security systems. But the government has no money with which to pay them, and one needs to provide for these people oneself. Well, that's trouble. And I'm not saying that all the easy solutions to any of these. One has to take, on the, take the trouble on the chin as well as the, as well as the solutions. Yeah, poor law is one of these, the, 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 the long term, another grand base in English history has been the poor laws. And there's been always a contest between villages, between the ruralized, rural village economies to get rid of their poor and to shove them onto the next parish. And Queen Elizabeth had trouble, and there was trouble before, and there's been trouble ever since. However, there are some things one needs to look at the bright side, and the purpose of my talk this evening is to cheer you all up. One, recognize that there are a lot of things going in our favor. That is to say, you know, so, uh, the, the villages would be much, much more located. People would be living at home. People would be li li living, uh, living at home. There would be probably more uh, extended, extended families. You know, the cost of living would be much lower. There would be quite a lot that one can do for the unemployed and for one's elderly, 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 elderly relations. So there are some things that can be done in the context of Social Security. <coughs> 
what about health? What do we do about that? If there you are in your, in your, in your, in your rural economy. Well, there are some good things one could say about that too. Quite a lot of things in our, in our, in our favor. One thing one does not, not, not like you to have is a lot of obesity. So that must save some trouble. And probably it would be no junk food. Uh, one's diet, diet to be a lot better. We'd be back to a dance, a diet, diet, diet like the, the Robert McClance and, and, and with the Widowson diet of the war, which is the best and most healthy diet that's been in, been in modern times. You may very well find the degenerative diseases, the can, ca cancer and the arthritis and the, uh, and, uh, and the osteoporosis and the coronary disease, they wouldn't disappear by any means, but they would probably be much less prevalent than they, than they have been. There would be less, the, the, the cost of, 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 of health would, 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 be, would be reduced. So there would in fact be, there would be people would be taking more, more, more exercise. Uh, people would probably be, be a, a, a smoking less, I would imagine, be hard to get tobacco in under those circumstances. There is no such thing as a society so poor that it can't afford to produce its own, its own alcohol out of, out of potatoes or something even worse. So I can't necessarily say the alcohol would be, uh, uh, be sorted, but if Rob Hopkins was in control, I can imagine that people would be, uh, ways would be found of preventing people getting drunk. So there are ways that, and but also uh, the other thing one has to say is that social capital would be very much developed. And one of the things which is very, very good for one's health is having friends. If, you have, if, you have, if you're well connected with, 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 friends, your chan uh, with, with friends and family, your chance of dying over the next five years is reduced by between half and five times. Five times less, le le less likely to die over the next five years if you've got lots of friends and families around. And if you haven't got any friends and family, but you decide to join a group of some kind, your chance of dying over the next, uh, next, one, year, uh, ne next one year is reduced by half. So we'd be a highly sort of socialized society and that would help to keep, 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 keep us healthy. So there may well be much less disease. So that would be something in our favor. There'd be other things in our favor too. One thing we would not have would be delocalized hospitals. There would have to be localized hospitals. There'd be no way of getting to Exeter or the nearest hospital, if that is your nearest hospital. There would have to be local, uh, local, local hospitals. There would be, probably, be, uh, probably be fewer specialism. There would be, at long last, a recovery, a, a, proper, a serious encouragement, a voluntarism. There would be voluntary help in hospitals that there used to be in the past and will be again, and there isn't, 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 isn't now. And there would be hope that there would be, it, would be, it, would be, it is possible to run small <coughs> local schools and produce absolutely spectacular consequences, results in education, reading and music and art and thought and constructiveness and niceness, that nice quality that nice people can have and many people don't. It can be done in, in local school. If you think of the other things that communities can do, one, they can, they can, uh, treat, treat, uh, they, they can teach the art, they can teach farming, they can teach masonry. They used to teach how to make a wagon. Well, I'm getting carried away here. I think you ought to make sure I don't go on too long. I've, I've, I've got a rather really... Oh, no. You, you're, not, you're kidding. May I have your permission to go on a little bit longer? I haven't got to the point yet. Oh, no, much more than that. Well, look, let, I'll negotiate. I'm going to have a lot of eye contact with, 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 with Rob, and I shall do terrible things to him if he, if he interrupts me. I, I want to get on to something which is really, really important. Actually, the whole point of this is, is still to come. I really do tell you, but... Uh, oh, dear. Well, how much can I cut out of what, I, what I'm going to say? Well, I will actually quickly say I mean, that, that the, the, the teaching of crafts in community is the most spectacular thing, and I would recommend if anybody had not read it, you, know, you read George Sturt's The Wheelwright Shop, and it, descri it describes, for one thing, the most wonderful thing about how they, made, they, make, they make wheels, and the, the, men, the men who have to drive the spokes into a, into, into a, into a hub. It's like, sort of like those are the barren boims of carpent, carpentry. They, the, the, there would be the hub, and there were these, these spokes, and they would pick up this, uh, this sledgehammer, and then with a leap, hit this spoke right in the middle, and it would stay there for the next 200 years. And it would be impossible to teach anybody that unless they start at the age of 12. And here's Gordon Brown saying they ought to keep them at school until 18. So there are things that communities can, 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 can do which are fundamental. I'm now cutting out a lot of really good stuff, and it's your fault, guys, right? <laughs> Oh, there's just one more thing I want to say on education. I'm going to leave other things, other things I was going to say on community education, but there is something to say about higher education. I mean, are we talking about a future in which there's no higher education any longer? Well, it would be a pity if that did happen. Um, but you know, 
As a Conservative Minister said uh, under the Thatcher government uh, not all that lo long ago, we have taken money from the people who write about ancient Egyptian scripts and about the prenuptial habits of the upper Volta Valley in order to give them to technical education. Uh, any society which has a Ministry of Education that says that doesn't deserve to have any education system at all. It's like tickling a dog's stomach. They had, do not know what, uh, what, what, what what higher education is for. And the moment we do not, to a large extent, don't have higher education. But there have been times in the past when higher education has been produced very, very successfully on very, very little money indeed, which is very, very local. For example, the Workers' Education Association, started in the late 19th century, had Albert Manbridge had spectacular results. And I've got actually at home, I've got the, the, the archive of some of the education which happened in, in, the, in, the, in the Horwich Literary Society. And Horwich is a very small engineering town, at least it was a very small engineering town. Um, they made um, very famous Horwich tank engines and steam, steam locomotives and they had the literary society let, met on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the, in the Railway Mechanics Institute. And uh, Mr. David Gibson was the uh, manager of the Horwich Loco Works and he was also a very, very good tenor and used to sing to them on Tuesdays. Uh, other people sang too, it wasn't just him every Tuesday I want to say, but nonetheless uh, and also there were, there were lectures on Thursdays about various literary topics and he was enthusiastic about Thomas Carlyle, about, uh, Thomas Carlyle and gave them a, gave them a, a lecture on, on, on poetry, um, which, uh, as lectures should do, make, makes a connection between the, what he's talking about and the locality. And I have a quote from him here, but I'll read out. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to go through all that. Oh. We're getting there. There we are. Poetry teaches us to see beauty all around us. We see it in the porridge. We see it in the wind streets with the old smoke blackened houses with their decent fronts on a clear east windy day. We see it when we look down on the black rod and Horwich Valley with its houses and factories. The gleams of water in the lodges. We may even find this beauty in the poetic interpretation of it in some of our big stately locomotives. Well, if I heard that lecture and that enthusiasm and that emotion and that passion and that connection in any modern university, English course in modern university, I'd be impressed. So there are things that localities can do on education. Defence, there are lots of things to say about defence, but under the eye of Rob, I'm going to leave defence on one side. It is the most difficult one anyway. On law and order, what does one do about law and order? Well, law and order was cracked to, actually cracked to a large extent in the past. We tend to underestimate the accomplishment of the medieval Gothic civilization. One of the reasons we underestimate that is because it was purged, almost all evidence of it was purged in the Reformation, with the exception of the cathedrals, which should give us some idea about how effective it was. They didn't have a police force. Can we afford, could, will we be able to afford a police force? The answer is no. Well, they couldn't then either. But they had an alternative. The Statute of Winchester in, 80, in, in, in 1285 defined the police function of every male in the, in, in the village. Every male had, from the age of 15 to 60 had to go around armed. The knights would have to wear a hauberk, which was a, a coat of mail and a sword. The poor, the poor, poor men have a bow, bow and arrow, arrow, arrow and a knife. When the church bell rang, they'd have to take part in the hue and cry. It was their, their responsibility to keep, to keep the, 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 the road verges free of vegetation, of, of, of trees, so the robbers couldn't hide behind them. And they had to get, take, take part in something called a posse comitatus, where if, any, if the Scots or neighbours got seriously uppy, they had to go out and sort them out. We now use posse in the context of the drug, drug gangs of Boston Mass. So they did have an effect, they did have a, a, a police force. It worked, it was an amateur police force. As far as crime detection was concerned, that was more pro problematic. They didn't really know very much about it. Very hard to know who did something and imagine a terrible deed. And how do you get, uh, and everybody's denying, denying doing it. Well, they had, 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 had something called the uh, compurgators, which was a jury, a, jury, a jury that would get together and say what, who they thought what, or thought done it. It wasn't very effective. They used to back this up with giving them tests, such as putting a stone, a pebble, at the bottom of a boiling, boiling cauldron and getting someone to pick the pebble, up, pebble out. And if their blister was, blister was bad enough, then it showed they were guilty. Or you know, grasping a, a red, red hot iron, or, 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 or walking over red hot coals. One wouldn't necessarily recommend these, these, these procedures in lo 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 localities. 
But we don't, don't need to do so because in many, many ways we actually are now becoming technologically able, capable of, of, of localization in a way no civilization ever been able to do, do, do before. The fact that we're localized doesn't mean we don't have access to DNA technology. We don't have access to the modern detect the detection techniques. It doesn't mean that we won't we won't have an amateur pol a, a pol police force capable of capable of taking part in this. Indeed, we will do this. Thing. Uh, suddenly, the the, the the citizen as an active part, uh, active participant in in the society will become crucial again. All these things can, can be done. And the last thing I should say about that is that magistrates, we inherit their brilliant system of magistrates, which, which came after the 1066, after the, the conquest. They, they existed informally for 300 years before they were finally you know, established in the 14th century. And we had them, a really thriving, wonderful system of magistrates, you know, capable of uh, you know, perturbing the peace and of keeping the society in order until about 10 years ago when the Labour government started dismantling it. You know. In this, in, this process, in, in this process of centralization and delocalization. There are still magistrates, and there may even be magistrates here. But on the whole, they're being centralized towards a large towns, so and localities are losing control of their law, law, law and order. And they're being sort of taken over by, 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 by the servants as stipendary magistrates. So to a large extent, the magistracy is, you know, is disappearing. That can be recovered. And then the last one we can look at is, is transport. In the case in the future, A, we won't be able to have transport because of the reason we discussed, and B, we will be developing local self-sufficiency. So will we need transport? No, we won't. Can one really imagine our road system being discarded, being abandoned? Well, indeed, it's happened twice before. The Roman, Roman road system was discarded. And then in 1837, we used to have the most wonderful transport system of the turnpikes, 20,000 miles of turnpikes, dual carriageway, 30 yards across. In 1842, they were empty, crucified by the, rail, by, by, by the, rail, by the railways. But the grass started going across them. They never, they never, never recovered. So there are things that can that, that, that can can be, can be done. Okay, right now I'm going to get to the point of what I really want to say, which is, if we're going to do all this, we're really going to show the localization can work in practice. We need to build communities around which can make them work. And this is very, very difficult, but nobody is talking about this, and I find it very difficult myself to talk about, because it's just not in the vocabulary, not in the mind, it's not well planted there, because it's sort of new stuff, and I'm still very unfamiliar with it. I feel a little bit I was walking over hot coals. <clears throat> but a community is a group in a particular place, a community is a group in a particular, pla in a particular place in which interactions and loyalties snake through the whole thing like well-tossed spaghetti. It's a, it's a grammar, it's a grammar of, com of, 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 of community, it's a, it's, a, it's a common inheritance, it's a humor and, and good faith which identify a community and give it existence. Well, that's what community is. So, let us actually sort of see what happens, um, what, how this applies. Now, there are different sorts of community, and the depth of obligation depends absolutely on the size of the community. Deep obligations exist in very small groups, in families of five to twelve people. Less deep obligations, but nonetheless crucial ones, exist in the next scale size up, which is 150. That is the group, that is the society, the essential size of group which will need to work in the future as a cooperative unit. That ain't me speaking, that is a huge literature on the, on the scale of, of a group which is large enough to be effective, but small enough actually be cooperative. It's 150. However big the community should be, it should recognize that it's the groups of 150 that are the groups of the, mat that the matter. Above that, there are large, larger groups which can be more or less any size you want, one could call them the parish. And above that, there is a, group, there is a, is, is a nation. And they all have different forms of reciprocity whose names are so long, I better not tell you what they are because I'd run out of time. But if one's going to do that, then one would need a culture. And one needs to recognize that culture is going to have a, a central job to do. Oh, right. Well, culture is, I think, the best, best thing is to give a metaphor. It's like the up, right, up like strands that you, you begin with when you're making a basket round which you wind the texture 
of the basket it, it, it's, it, 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 itself. It is, it actually is the culture which is, which is the grammar. And a lot of the culture and a lot of the texture of the, texture of the community which I'm talking about, in fact, is inherited. Much of the culture which works in a community building sense is not something which we do because we like to do it, but because we've inherited. And the person who explains this best is the philosopher Edmund Burke. And I'm going to read out to you what he said about it. Oh yes, I should have ended up with that. I was in such a hurry. Can I just go back to Ivan Illich on transport? Can I just forget about needing transport, concentrate on space? Ivan Illich said, what we need to think about is space that offers to each person the constantly renewed experience that the center of the world is a place where he stands, walks, and lives. You can't put it better than that, really. Anyway, what I really wanted to show you was Edmund Burke. Much the strongest moral obligations are such as were never the result of our option, wrote Burke in an appeal for the new to the old Whigs. Men without their choice derived, derived, it should be derived, benefits from that association. Without their choice, they are subjected to duties in consequence of these benefits. Without their choice, they enter into a virtual obligation as binding as any that is actual. So culture, to a very large extent, and the way the communities work, is to a very large extent something we inherit. We have to actually hang on to everything we, can, we, we, we possibly can, all the in cultural inheritance we, we have got. Okay, anyway, we know, we know what culture is now, and now I'm going to come into my concluding part of what I'm going to say. I'm actually getting to the point now. And let's actually say what, uh, okay, what, uh, what, what culture does. What does culture actually do? Why do we, why, why do we need it? Well, it does three things. Thing number one is it provides social cohesion. That is to say, social cohesion is a difference between a group, a cooperative group, and a crowd of individuals that are indifferent to each other or actually hostile to each other. And That's really all one needs to say about, about, about cohesion, actually. Except that how is cohesion expressed? You don't say, here we are, all being jolly cohesive together. How it's actually expressed is it's in, it's in culture. Cohesion is expressed in music, in choirs, in going to choir practice, in doing things which are cultural together, which are not cloying together, which actually have cu cultural integrity and cultural accomplishment together. And the second thing it, the, the, that uh, the culture does it develops a public sphere, and not many people are talking about a public sphere either. And the public sphere is something which exists, but you are, take part in when you are expressing yourself in a community not as yourself, that is to say you're no longer thinking about your problems and about uh, why it is that your compost loo doesn't work and about how difficult neighbours are and what you do do with the apples and who is stealing your cabbages and things like that and generally the mechanics of how to, co how to cope. You're actually saying, okay, enough of all that, maybe we'll come back to that, to that tomorrow, but let's now raise our thoughts to, to higher things. So, in the, public, in, the, in the public sphere, that is to say, you are not just expressing yourself as you are, you're not being, in the modern sense, authentic. You're actually doing something, you're taking part in something which you know in the literature as self-distance. You're saying, don't look at me, don't think just about me. I'm not expect coming here as me, I'm coming here uh, as a member of the community. And to some extent, in fact to a very large extent, that, you know, the absence of the public sphere is expressed in the modern age by the fact that people aren't dressing properly. I don't want to become moralistic and ranty, ranty about dress. That's not my purpose at all. But one of the reasons, in fact, the justification for when you go to dinner parties as in Islington as one does, <laughs> every bloke looking as though he's a plumber, every woman looking as though she's brought a plumber. In some cases, they probably have. You never know. But clothes are sort of not the thing, the way to express oneself is self distance is to do something really silly, like wear a bow tie, something with absolutely no practical value at all. It makes you look a little, little bit daft. 
a public expression requires something which is not of practical value. The public sphere has no direct practical value in his direct as cultural expression. That's the first thing that happens in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the public sphere. And I think it's actually worthwhile saying that, that there is a question of demoralization here. One of the reasons why the public sphere is no longer recognized, is not no longer expressed, is because people have become demoralized. Who cares less? Who, nobody cares really about the public sphere any longer. What is the public sphere? Nobody has any idea. Maybe people, you, have little idea what I'm talking about in terms of the public sphere. It's just not part of our experience. Young people would have no clue but it's a matter of demoralization. That is what's happening. We no longer think we belong to a public sphere with matters any longer. So when one's actually talking about relocalization, we're talking about remoralization as well. The two relocalization and remoralization are the same are, are the same things. It's actually saying your locality matters and it matters more than in practical terms, it matters in cultural terms as well. And in that context, it is possible to play. Play has been fundamental to every resilient, long-lasting civilization. These villages I was telling you about, which we need to recover if we're going to keep the DNA of human society going. They need to have a culture of play. I'm getting very near the end now. What does, what does play do? Play is such a relief because it means you can get very, very close to somebody and we will need to get very, very close to people in the, future, in the community of the future. But if you get that close, it can be a little bit terrifying. You don't, just don't want to be all that close to people. And come on, that you can take these things too far. In the context of play, there's also distance. So you establish your, 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 your difference and your separate identity in the context of play. And this is well recognized in the play literature. You get very close with, with, with people and you agree, you, agree, you agree to be adversarial with them. Um, so you're establishing your difference and at the same time you're, 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 you're colluding in, in this common, act, uh, common activity. And that is a way of bonding. It's very hard to bond with anybody effectively without play. Without play, it just becomes sort of cloying or nasty or you, just fall, or you just, just fall apart. And it's also very good for your body because it releases serotonin. And if we deprive the serotonin, then you're likely to be involved in a drug addiction, violence, tantrums, withdraw, with, with, withdrawal, uh, depression and boredom. Sounds like everybody's idea of a teenager. Could be something to do with that. Maybe they lack serotonin. So, very near the end. Promise. That's the second thing the public sphere does. And the third thing the public sphere does, it develops practice. And practice is an idea which was described by Alistair McIntyre, which is accomplishment in an artistic skill, such as playing the piano, or being very good at something very difficult. And I was talking about this yesterday, so but that some people will be familiar with what I'm about to say. However, Alison McIntyre developed the idea that if you are very good at something like, say, 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 say play, play, playing the piano, or whatever it may, may, may be, the three moral qualities are developed in you. One, number one, is truthfulness, because there's no possibility of you actually knowing, uh, re re reaching a, a level of accomplishment without actually having some sense of truth or falsehood. You can judge your own performance. The second is fairness or justice. You can judge other, judge other people's performance. And the third is culture. You, uh, is, is, sorry, the third is, 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 is courage, because you're always slightly going beyond what you've ever done before. You're always testing your limits. And those three, if ever one, one wanted us a package of moral qualities, those are the three which, which one, can, one can package pro properly. Those are the three things which come from, the public, uh, from, from accomplishment. So that's what public sphere does. And now the last thing that, does, that culture does, which is then, then I will really stop talking, is that it develops something which may be the most fundamental thing of all, which is judgment. We're, we're suffering from a depletion of oil, we're suffering from a depletion of many things, and above all, we're, 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 we're suffering from a depletion of good judgment. We seem to have lost the ability to think. We're digging our whole, the hole deeper and deeper with every public decision that's made, and probably a, a bad judgment is spilling over into personal judgment as well. So the question is, how does culture develop judgment? Well, it develops it in the following way. Number one, number, number, number one it establishes your identity, because if you are accomplished in a culture, you take part in your community's culture, then that gives you the identity, and you, therefore if you have an identity, if you have an identity, you know what you're making a judgment about. If you don't have any identity, there is no way in which reason actually makes any sense at all. There are some areas of life, such as Euclidean ge geometry, in which a sort of free-raging ra rationality exists, whether there's any, anybody around to know it or not. 
but actually in most of the circumstances of our lives, we have to have an identity before reason makes any sense at all. And the illustration of that, you imagine uh, an antelope being chased by a lion. The antelope's reason says, I need to run away from this lion. And the lion's reason says, I need to chase this ant antelope. And those reasons are both right, but they're all entirely based on, related to, founded on the identity of said antelope and, li and lion. And it is actually becoming not Rhetoric is not hyperbole to say that in our society, in our failing society, we are losing our sense of identity to such an extent we are losing our ability to reason, but we don't know who we are any longer. The second thing which is related to that is that if you have established your identity by your involvement or participation in culture, you can actually get rid, you actually in command of your own identity. You don't have to prove anything. If you don't have to prove anything, you can come to a problem without any baggage. You don't have to come to every problem in order, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a particular agenda. And you can take case-by-case case case judgments. And that, I'm glad to say, ladies and gentlemen, takes us back to that wonderful period. I don't want to exaggerate how wonderful it was. It had problems as well. It had good qualities as well. The medieval period in which they developed this property of taking of making case-by-case case ju judgments. And they made a lot out of it. It was just one of the few things that kept Christendom together, that it has to do with the integrity of being able to, of, of, of not, not approaching things in a big, catch-all scientific way, but actually looking, looking at the person in the eye and saying exactly what are the circumstances that are, that are going on here. That later came to be called casuistry. And needless to say, as science began to, began to came on, come on stream in the 17th century, it began to be rubbished. And Blaise Pascal rubbished it in his Lettres, Lettres Provinciales in 1656 in a polemic of such absolute savagery that casuistry has been a term of abuse ever since. And from since then, philosophers have been earning an almost amount of money, which is entirely undeserved, developing broad philosophical principles on, in terms of which to make, make that, that, that. So that's the third, third, third I'm, my last. He's making the most fearful signs of me, for which he will suffer <laughs> later. I have about five more sentences. Would you like to hear my last five sentences then? You see? Right. I hope I've explained to you why. If we're going to join together and make a future, the first thing we need to do is to go off to choir practice. I kid you not, it's parody. It is the bit that's been forgotten about. It's the culture that comes first. Indeed, we do have to find ways of swapping vegetables and developing renewable en en energy systems and doing such very difficult things and making ourselves self-sufficient. Self and those things are very difficult and absolutely essential. They're uh, non-negotiable. And thank goodness we are doing, doing it. But that's not what it's about. What it's really about is starting now to build localities that ring with creative vitality and which we can call home. Thank you.